I have never been looked up to so many speakers before. <laughs> <coughs> but I think it is good for I come in the name of the Holy Spirit. I ask the Holy Spirit to use me as an instrument for you today. Before I do so, I would like to say that last night, Sister Anne Marie Walsh sent us an email to all the Sisters of Our Lady Society all over the world to tell us that yesterday she met with the oncologist to tell her she would not need to undergo chemotherapy. So we praise the Lord for that. The theme of this sharing is healing the wounded image of women. I prayed so much, my sisters, for today. And right now, every bone in my body is shaking. So I am nervous. <laughs> but when I prayed, When I prayed, is it better? When I prayed, my first thoughts that came to me was the reality of the gift given to us as women to be daughters, spouses, and mothers. We are called to be life givers, to be receptive of reentry, as Father said, toward receiving and nurturing new life. It can be a physical maternity and or a spiritual maternity. Spiritual maternity is nurturing the emotional, cultural, moral, and spiritual life of the other. I can tell you that I am a spiritual mother. I have so many children all over the world. I cannot count them. I cannot count them. And it's a full-time job for me. But I will not change it for anything in the world. And I'm sure you would say the same. As a religious sister, it is not something that is only given to me. It is given to all women this grace, this gift, to be mothers in the order of grace and the spiritual natural life. Blessed John Paul II said, Human life is not just physical life, it is also spiritual life. It is not just physical maternity, it is also spiritual maternity. And many times, my sisters, we forget that. We forget that reality. For me, it is such an awesome gift, entrusted to each and every single one of us. And I ask you today, are you aware of it? And if you are, do you embrace it? And if you embrace it, do you embrace it to its fullness? And if you embrace it to its fullness, do you embrace it into its depth? Each and every one of us desire to be whole and to be healed. And yet we are wounded. That's the reality of life. I am also a wounded person, very wounded person. And we are wounded in three essential parts, to original sin, to the wounds of others, and to the sins that we commit ourselves. And that does something to us. It distorts the vision and image that we have of ourselves. God created you and I into his image and to his likeness. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that we may be in communion with him. That's the greatness and the dignity of our person. To be in communion with the Trinity. You know, I have just stated a profound truth in just a few lines. 
And perhaps some of you are wondering, why is Sister amping about that? We know that. We know that. I am saying to you what has touched me so profoundly 10 years, 11 years ago. I came to Our Lady Society. It's going to be 11 years on the 13th of May. And I found a Father Jim Flanagan, who is still alive, who's going to be 90 years old in May, and present that to us all the time. Remember that you are created in the image and likeness of God. I've been a religious nearly 42 years. And that never came home to me as much as it has done in these last 10 years. So I ask you, you are created in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? It means, my sisters, that we are the reflective beauty of God. You, looking at me right now, are the reflection of my Father. Your smile, smile at me. Good. Your smile is as simple as a smile. This is what I learned from Mother. I was a missionary charity contemplative for 27 years, first candidate. I saw Mother and lived with Mother in the last years of her life, which I'm going to talk to you later on. If I learned something from Mother, is that it's very simple to reflect God by your smile. If you, Mother used to say to us, if you cannot say a word, you can smile. And if you cannot smile, at least you can say a prayer in your heart. It's simple, my sisters. The reflection and the love of God. It makes all the difference in somebody else's life. All the difference. Right now, it sure makes a difference to me. 450 people looking at me and smiling, it makes a big difference. <laughs> Our image of God is wounded to original sin. We cannot get away from that. It's our inheritance from our first parents. It obscures the image of God, but it does not destroy it. It does not destroy it. We must keep our focus on that reality. And Blessed John Paul II brought that often back to us to remember, to go back to the original plan that God has for me from all eternity. I am unique and you are unique. My superiors say to me, thank God there's only one of you. <laughs> I don't know if it was a positive or a negative. I never dared to ask. But we are unique. We are unique. He destroys, it does not destroy the original plan that God has for me. We are called, each and every one of us, to reclaim the gift. Go back and reclaim that gift. That's what John Paul II told each one of us. The gift to reveal God in his mysteries and to our very lives. We must believe. Somebody asked me not long ago, I give many talks. This is the first time before so many. And I hope it's going to be my last. <laughs> I'll tell you why at the end. Somebody asked me not long ago, Sister, in the gospel Jesus said that we would make and do greater works than him. Why is it that it's not, we don't do that today? And I said, my simple answer is we have a lack of faith. We do not have faith. We do not believe in ourselves. When Sister Anne called me and said, Sister Maria said, um, I'd like to send you to Idaho. And I said, well, oh, Sister, I think there's somebody else that can go. She says, no, I think it's you. 
Oh, sister, really? Well, let's pray about this. Eight, I am. <laughs> you know why? I'm not qualified. I know that. I know that. So we do not have faith that we must believe the truth. But we, know, we need to know something very profound. We need to know our weaknesses and where do we fall. That's important. I was a superior for 13 years and a formator. And the biggest struggle for our sisters is to know where their weaknesses were, where their struggles were, why they were not becoming holy, why they were not responding to grace. That's why you need to know. Not to pull you down, but to pull you forward. So you respond to become the person God wanted you to be from all eternity. You need to know your weaknesses. Because your weaknesses will rotate on the sins you commit. And where another place you're being wounded is with the wounds that others have inflicted on you. We wound others, my sisters. We wound others. Nece not necessarily because we want to. Hmm? And the first wounds that we suffer is sometimes the wounds from our parents, our fathers and our mothers. I cannot tell you, as a superior, as a spiritual mentor, as a spiritual mother, how many times I deal with this. My father said this to me. My mother said this to me. It doesn't condition you, my sisters. They are human beings just like you and me. Hmm? The wounds of others are the first ones that profoundly impact us. Especially we have not been affirmed by them, encouraged by them. <coughs> not so long ago, I lived with a genius. I lived with a sister who's a genius. When I was growing up as a little girl, my mother used to tell me, now listen, Susie, that was my name, Susie. <laughs> now listen, Susie, thank God you're not as intelligent as the others. I didn't quite understand what that meant. But now living with a genius, I know what that means. And I do thank him, by the way. The sins of others, we wound others. Your spouse, you have received wounds from your spouses. Maybe some of you are divorced, separated, having struggled with your husband. You have wounds, and you also may be in wound, have inflicted wounds on him. It's not just a one-way traffic. Wounds from my friends. Wounds from coworkers. I hear this all the time. From my neighbors, and even from strangers. What do they tell us? These wounds all come down to a lack of recognition of my dignity and the worth of my person, which is you. That's why it tells me, when somebody hurts me, tells me something wrong or bad, that really hurts me. And sisters, I have been very hurt in my life. Very hurt in my life. And they always told me, you're not important. Here, I would like to make us aware of the power of our words in the lives of others. We have a power to bless with our words or to hurt the other with our words. When I came to Our Lady's Society, I was wearing my sari with the missionary charity wear. Mother was just blessed. I was walking with our general sister servant from the Society of Our Lady of Most Holy Trinity, Sister Anne Mary Walsh, was my journal for 10 years, became my friend. Yes. And somebody in the parking lot went by, totally ignored the sisters, the salt sisters, and were all over me. I was wearing Mother Teresa's sari. I felt it in the depths of my being that they ignored my sisters. 
but they were running, and I'm using the expression after the sorry, the popularity of mother. I felt the pain in my being. See? And as I walked along with Sister Anne, I said to Sister Anne, Sister, if I want anything in my life, I want to be a blessing. That's why I always say, God bless you. I want to be a blessing. My life, I want it to be a blessing. Why? Because I've been so hurt by remarks of others. I've been so hurt, my sisters, by the fact that I'm no longer a missionary charity and people look down at me. People call themselves my friends. Don't talk to me anymore. They think I've gone off my rocker or something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I am. I'm off my rocker for the love of God. St. <laughs> James warns us of the little muscle that we have tend to forget, the tongue. The misplaced joke, the tease, the little hint about somebody, the rude word, the impatient word, sarcastic word. You could all have your litany. Or even, I would say, my reactions and my attitudes. I hurt a lot my sisters by my attitudes and my reaction. I have very spontaneous reactions. You read everything in my face. Okay? We can hurt people. But even more so by my silence. I just don't talk. I give them what we call the cold shoulder. I've had a lot of cold and a hot shoulder, I can tell you that. We can. We can. And we do. And here, the Lord put a song on my heart. I'm not a good singer, but it's Lent, so you have to do some penance. Okay? <laughs> so I'm going to sing this little song to you all. That I sing often to remind me to be a blessing. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul rejoice. Come along if you know it. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let's do this again together. I love you, Lord, and I Yes, Lord, let it be. The wounds of culture, the wounds of culture, my sisters, wound us. Today, there's such a distortion of the meaning of beauty. The concept that comes to us from the culture is a superficial understanding of beauty. The image that it gives us that we believe that we have to live up to is superficial and manipulated. I really don't look much at television. I have no time. 
And if I do a hockey game, I used to play hockey, you know. I used to play hockey in order I'm 64, almost. <coughs> I still can give a very good body check. I do not look at television much. But when I do, what I see of the media tells me it distorts a lot the beauty of the body of women. It does. It distorts the concept of beauty, affects how I look at myself. It affects how I feel about myself and how I understand myself. Many people today equate body image and self-image. I have sent this paper that I took quite a long time to write. I never write my talks. I always let the Holy Spirit guide me. So I'm always, they say, fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> Today I'm not flying by the seat of my pants. But I sent this paper to quite a few friends of mine. I was very touched by what they came back with. Almost everybody came back with this note. Many people today wait. Self-image, body image or self-image. What the world projects, the way you should look. And we have serious problems in that area, my sisters. Serious problems. The world tells me I should be slim. I give talks to men, believe it or not. That's what I do. I give a lot of talks to men. And I talk exactly about this thing. Hmm? Your wife may be weighing 50 pounds more than what she was the day you walked down the aisle with her. Is she less lovable today? Because she's gray-headed and she has wrinkles? That woman you walked down the aisle with, did you marry her body or did you marry her? My sisters, know your dignity. Know your dignity. It is not on a slim or what size do we wear. Thank God as sisters, we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, let me explain. Okay? The, the habit I'm wearing right now belongs to somebody else. So we can exchange habits. It's a bit too long for me. I'm only four, ten and a half, but it's okay. <laughs> Do not let the world dictate to you your beauty. Do not. It is not in the appearance of the exterior, my sisters. We are royal. We are royal. Scripture says, the beauty of the king's daughter is found within. The beauty of the king's daughter is found within. It's inside what counts. Not at the outside appearance, my sisters. Do you believe? You know, when I was a superior, I always asked three questions. I like the Trinity. I belong to the Society of Lady the Most Holy Trinity. I always asked three questions. Somebody told me it was a kind of a mental situation, but anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Do you believe that you are daughter of the king? to believe that you are royal people. Do you believe that? Some of you are nodding, not everybody. I should have 450 nods pointed this way. Not <laughs> believe it in your heart. Do you really believe it? Do you really? Nothing makes you more beautiful than the state of grace. The state of grace. <clears throat> Permit me to share with you a personal story. I had two. I had two stories. I'm going to share one. Maybe two, but let me say one. <laughs> Mother Teresa of Calcutta is someone I called mother for 27 years. She was my mother. She taught me 
everything I know about religious life. I mean everything. A mother won't mind me saying this. She wasn't the most beautiful person in the world. She wasn't. To me, mother looked like a peasant, if you will. Big hands, big feet. Hmm? She was strong. Little, but strong, mighty. But there was something about mother. I experienced it so many times as a daughter. And I saw the world around her experience it also. When you looked at mother, there was such a beauty in mother that it attracted people. I saw people actually cry, tears flowing, when mother went by at a distance. I saw that. I witnessed that. I heard of conversions of people just being in the audience listening to a simple message. Why? It wasn't her physical appearance. It was the beauty that radiated from her person. And mother never attracted you to her. It, she was the vessel. It went through her to God. She always pointed you to God. Always. Always. That's one example. I could give you another one. I may give you one at the end. I'm looking at my watch now, Rita. <laughs> my sister's outward beauty is fleeting. What makes you beautiful is what is found inside of us. When you are in a state of grace, It's not what the world tells you. It's not cosmetics. It's not the fashion. The tennis shoes you wear, I don't think you wear tennis shoes, but anyway. It's not that. Don't waste your time on that. Come close to God. And radiate his beauty. That's what is going to make you beautiful. And finally, I would like to speak to you a little bit about our home personal sinfulness. Sin always is destructive for the person. It lowers us. It weakens us. It enslaves us. Mm. We are not created to live that way. We are predisposed by original sin, by the sins against others that are committed against us, our home personal sin that we have done, and yet, that's not what we're created. We're not created that way. We need to be healed. And this is where we bring everything together. We have to seek redemption and healing from our own sinfulness also. Dealing with souls, I have encountered this so many times. They always say, Sister, I do this because, because, and it's always somebody else. Always somebody. You've got to deal with what you do also. It's part of your healing. You have to put all of it together. And this is what we find in a woman in the gospel when they found Jesus. First and foremost, they found liberation and a deep, profound experience of the love of God for them, as they are. If you want to come to wholeness, you will never come to it by dealing only with original sin and the sins that others have committed against you. If you want to come to healing and wholeness, you must also deal with the sins that, is, that you have committed. Why is that so important? Because God will not heal us. God, because God will not only heal us, but he will bring us back to his original plan for us. We go back to 
to what God, we reclaim what God wanted for us in the beginning. And also, he will involve us in his life and his work, and he will show us a mission in our life. I don't know if you came upon that. I'm a missionary. I'm a contemplative missionary, and I've been so all my life. But all of us have been entrusted with a work, all, every single person. And so many times I've met in my life, people don't have a clue what God wants them from them. I do not know what God wants from me. I do not know what God wants from me. They do not have a direction, a sense in their life. We all have a mission, all of us. We all have a work that God wants us to accomplish. And his plan that no one else can do. That's how important you are. Many times that reality we do not realize. Each one of us has an important work that God wants us to do. And if you have already found it, he will deepen it. He will deepen the mission he has already given you. Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, mother, often told this to us, her children. Often. Mother would remind us that today, today, I am the hands of Jesus. Today, I am the feet of Jesus. Today, I am the face of Jesus. Today, I am the heart of Jesus. If we only had peers to hear, a heart to understand his teachings to us, when he comes to me and talks to me. Today, I am Jesus to you, and you are Jesus to me. Today, and if I do not fulfill that mission, it may be a difference in the life of someone else. It may be a difference of them encountering personally Jesus, their love for him. You make a difference. And she should tell us this in reference to the apostolate. Do you realize the mission given to you? That's my question to you in your time of prayer. Do you realize the mission God is entrusted to you? And if not, like I said, I've met this a lot along the way. And if not, I would like to give you a clue. <clears throat> the clue is in the area of your woundedness. The clue is in the area of your woundedness. The Lord will bring you back to that area. Because there, there's always a gift. There's always a grace. Always, my sister, it doesn't matter how deep, how profound, how horrific could be. There's always a grace. There's always a gift. And this is how you begin to heal. There's always a two-way traffic. He will always put someone in your life, always, to help you carry the cross. <coughs> I had a very personal experience in my own life, which I'm going to share with you now. When I left, I le when I left the mission to charity, five years of discernment. Five years, my sisters. Painful, the most ex painful experience of my entire life. Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, as you may know, mother was a Loretto sister for 20 years. And she said, leaving Loretto was more painful than leaving her own family, her own mother. When I heard that many years ago, it goes one ear, in one ear and comes out the other many times. But this I understand today more deeply than anything because I've lived it. When I came to Our Lady Society, so I did not encounter, I did not think in my mind that it would be so painful to leave. I call this now the grieving, the separation, the grieving, the loss, if you will. And I was, it was, 
level. And a young sister, a young sister, just in formation, one evening wrote me a little note. And she said, Sister, permit me to be your spiritual Simon. I already spoke to that sister. She was in formation, that was a different area, I was a profess. Permit me to become your spiritual Simon. So I wrote back a note, I said, what do you mean? What does that mean to you? What does it mean? And she said, on the way to Calvary, Simon of Cyrene helped Jesus carry his cross. I want to be your spiritual Simon. I want to pray for you and help you for whatever you're going through. Sisters, that touched me so deeply. So deeply. Since we have, she's a professed member now, since we have become, I'm a spiritual mother. That's what she calls me, a, spirit, a little spiritual mother. Okay. We become friends, we are sisters. But little did I know when I said yes to her that day, the healing that I would affect in her life and the healing she has affected in mine. That's an example that I'm giving you. I'm going to pull this to a close. Healing comes when we embrace the gift of being infinite love, infinitely loved by God. I am healed when I embrace the truth of being loved. I am healed when I open myself to my own belovedness. I was very struck by this conference, the title of this conference. Belovedness. My sisters, if there's anything you go home with, and I'm sure you're gonna go home with plenty. Rita tells me she sends you home with a little gift today. The blessing of a living father, blessing of a, the next speaker. If there's a gift you go home with today, Know how precious you are before the sight of God. Do not just know it in your head. There's a big, Madhu used to say, there's a big distance between the brain and the heart. Know it in your heart. And once you know that, your life will change. Once you know that, the church will change. And once you know that, my sisters, the world will change. <clears throat> and I'm gonna close with one reality. This is really my closing now. <laughs> we get to see in what the world tells us is success. If you want to change the world, my sisters become holy. That's what will change the world. Holiness. Holiness will transform the world. We have so many problems, and they seem so unbearable sometimes. It seems almost impossible. I hear it all the time. My answer, become holy. Become holy. And I use the word of Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta said so many times. Holiness is not the luxury of you. It's a simple duty for you and for me. Holiness is not the luxury of you. It's a simple duty for you and for me. Mother said, I am only a little pencil in God's hands. Today, do I know? Or yes, I know. I'm a little pencil in God's hands. Mother said, God uses nothingness to show his greatness. Do I know today standing in front of you that I am nothing? Absolutely I do. But I tell you with one thing, with, with certitude, with certitude I tell you one thing. I know for a fact that each and every single one of you are beloved by God. I know that for a fact. I did not need a dictionary. I did not need to spend hours in prayer. 
Why? I know it inside of myself. Holiness is not the luxury of the few. It's a simple duty for you and for me. We want to change the world and transform. You want to be who God has called you to be? Be holy, my sisters. Be holy. I, I close with a song. A little song of every missionary charity. Be with us, Mary, along the way. Guide every step we take. Lead us to Jesus, your loving Son. Come with us, Mary, come. May God bless you.